Now, uh, we're moving forward. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of our next guests. It's, uh, it comes from a financial uh, or business, uh, let me say, uh, area. So we have uh, Mr. Nicolas Muller, which is the CFO for Telecom Romania. Nicolas, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, what do you prepare for us? Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Hi to everybody. My name is Nic Nicholas. I'm the CFO of Telecom Romania, as you said, and I'm happy to talk to you guys today and uh, that you are spending your time with me and I'm allowed to tell you, tell you a bit about um, our experience, our stories, especially mine. It's more a practitioner's approach and um, not like the innovator, but more like using what's there and how to adapt it. Allow me to share as well my screen with you and uh, hopefully you're seeing this now mm -hmm. um, so i would like to talk to you about how we have built and also failed and learn from this and have been growing our rpa and big data and ai at um, dt not only in romania but also in germany where i've been working before on this and um, as you might know we in romania we are um, uh, here to help keep Romanians connected, that's our key thing, but also uh, telecom as such is close to the IT space. We are very active with T-Systems and with our local uh, company here in the ICT space. We're also innovating sometimes in certain areas. We have a big um, AI and innovation team located at the headquarter. So for example, we also have some kind of like um, Alexa from Amazon, which is a magenta speaker and things like this. So there is a lot of uh, innovation which we're driving, which is also driven by data. But I'm now speaking more from the perspective on how you use it in your, let's say, everyday telco operator's life and um, what is helping you there. Um, you might ask yourself, why is the CFO speaking at the CIO conference? Well, actually, uh, I was told by Hugo that I'm not the first CFO, but I'm you know, one, uh, I think not so recent, uh, there have been one around. So I'm happy to have the honor to speak to you guys because CFOs are usually, you know, perceived as dry, numbers crunching, old, white hair, not so innovative, where uh, typically IT guys are younger, hipster, agile, and embracing technology. And um, I do have to admit, I have this kind of nerdy side to me as well. I'm not tattooed as the a uh, young guy here on my page or my slide is shown, but uh, I do have this uh, yeah, passion for these new topics and how to actually get impact out of them because that's the key point that I'm gonna talk about, how do you get impact out of this? And what I learned from all those topics is to have impact, it's really, really relevant in an existing, um, let's say old school uh, company in that regard that is not inventing this and bringing it to the market to get uh, exponential growth and exponential growth in impact. And um, I can tell you two, three stories on how we've been driving this, where I've been part of that and how we did it. Um, and for this, you need to be first and the courageous, you need to drive it, pick it up because every new topic that's coming around, you can try it out. And while you're trying out, you will see how it works and what does not work, adapt it and then further drive it. And uh, for this, you just need to be courageous because that was also the first time when I picked up the robots in Germany, I went to the Netherlands and uh, worked, went to a, a different telco operator and that this small thing called RPA back in 2013. I was thinking what to do with that. And um, we played around with it and then we made it bigger. And out of this then we created something which internally created a hype and which is now helping me to drive this in other areas of the group as well. And, um, but when you start doing this new things, what you typically see is people are very skeptical about your new ideas, right? Whether you can try them out and they don't trust you or uh, they don't trust the person behind the idea. Um, and you have to show that you're truly committed. Also link your success to their success. So for example, when I first time came with the RPAs, I went to my CFO at that moment in time because I haven't been a CFO before. I've been working operations. And I said, look, if you give me 5 million, I'll give you 50 million back in 12 months. Or if I show you all my ideas, you can shoot down any idea you want. Or I don't use the shooting down of your ideas for an excuse for me not to come up with the overall result that I promised. And all those things, also customer experience and uh, user experience. 
And these promises, they give the trust to those people, these decision makers, and the surrounding of you that you are really committed not only to playing around with something new where nobody knows what comes out, but also that you commit to success. And this success we have seen two times, most recently now in Romania, where my team, Robert Yoshu and the colleagues have built up the biggest robot farm um, in Romania for UiPath. At least that's what the colleagues from UiPath have confirmed me last week again. So we have been doubling each year, each half year actually, each six months, and then each year, um, the number of our robots. And by this, we are now at approximately 200 robots in the Romanian organization. While on the right-hand side, you see how we've done it in Germany. Now there we are above 3,000 robots. And we started with one robot in my office, and we ended up with opening up a whole data center. You see that in the middle of the picture where I'm handing over the data center to uh, one of my team guys, uh, Marco, who took it then and is now driving it to further growth. And that was pretty cool to see that and be part of that. And I can tell you what are the differences between those two um, situations? What are the commonalities? So in Romania, we've been using mainly a supply UI path all cloud-based and we're doing with an upfront investment. So we're paying the developers upfront and then we let it run. Mainly in the areas of finance and B2B, we've been growing. And we started with some nerds playing around with robots to now the biggest robot farm. And in Germany, we're playing around with three different suppliers, uh, another Monday, Blue Prism and Nice. It's all desktop-based because the IT landscape where I started this, it's more like you need a you know, hard desktop to, to run a, a robot on this one. Sounds a bit crazy now, but at that moment in time was that. We never had the upfront investment, we paid per transaction. It was mainly in call center and field service where we drove it. And it went from one desktop to the small office room to a bigger office room. Then we went to uh, the, the room above um, and um, on, the, on the floor above. And we had to move out because we had too many desktops in there. It was about to crack. And in the summer it was getting very hot over 40 degrees. So we had to move to this professional um, um, data center, which you just saw. And now it's really professionalized and running quite smoothly. And the commonalities are whenever you start, there are more people wanting to join your journey than you thought, also from areas you didn't expect. So talk about it, work around the organization. There are more people coming forward than when they hear it than you ever expect. Some people, on the other hand, are afraid to lose their jobs or their influence. Typically, also in the IT area, some traditional IT guys are then saying, look, why do we need those robots? You know, we have our regular IT infrastructure with which we can do that in applications. Why to do that? But there are quite often good reasons why to do that. And at a certain moment in time, you reach a tipping point where the topic is so big and so interesting, it's fueling itself. And then it's just, you know, a lot of fun because you only went through it. And giving nerds a chance pays off. I have to say uh, the first um, people that I always met in Germany and Romania, when you were talking about people interested in RPAs, they always seemed to be a bit nerdy and they had a very techy background, not often in any kind of IT or um, RPA topic, but more like you know technology and they had a great passion for trying out new things technology wise. And if you give those people, it pays off a chance. If you give them the chance, it pays off. What did we fail or where did we fail? Well, you don't have to waste time looking for experts. I think in the beginning, I always was looking for the one person or the two persons that know everything that I need to hire and that goes ahead. They're not there. Rather hire for attitude and heart, uh, and then they will learn it. Don't take simple things for granted. Access to the ERP system, uh, GDPR compliance, things like this. These are the little things that are really making you stumble. For example, uh, I had at one point in time also uh, people calling me up saying, look, you have all those 100 employees working for you that, that are not, never showing up in the canteen. We cannot plan our, um, our lunch for the canteen. I said, look, but which 100 people are you talking about? There are all those people here. And then they were reading out the names and these were all robots. So there are simple things that are going wrong when you're doing and building this up. If you are programming too simple, it's not good. If you're programming too complex, it's also not good. Another story which we did when we were into Romania and programmed the robots, we had the CEO uh, writing emails uh, to a wide distribution list and he captured into this distribution list 
the robots because we had to implement as well email addresses for those. And then they were responding to the CEO saying, look, we don't understand what you're saying. Here's the, you know, here's the website where you can, you know, fill in your request that you have. And actually uh, the secretary that was running his office first did it in the beginning, then she complained and then we found out and then we had to adjust. Um, there's no silver bullet. I always thought that you just have to find one or two processes that you, you know, turn into a robot and then it's, you know, so clear and um, shiny and convincing that everybody will jump on. But you will not find those two or three from the very beginning. It's rather better to grab 20 and shoot all of the 20 ideas because some of them will fail for certain reasons. Some will get bigger than, bigger than expected. Some will be smaller than expected. So the big pipeline is like driving sales, always having a sales pipeline of robots ideas and driving this through is the great, great thing. And spending time to find allies and, uh, and, and friends to support it. There are unions, there are IT departments, there are experts, there are beneficiaries that they don't want it. And you need to spend much, much more time helping those people to accept it and to adapt it and to support it than I always thought before. And it was sometimes throwing me back several weeks and months. Um, and now I've learned this from the two launches that I've seen that this is one of the key things to do. So success factors in driving robots is staying open-minded, be curious, always learn more, always meet with people, always look at the topics. The team is everything, attitude and heart. Boldness brings results, you know, make a big promise at the beginning, declare victory when you're halfway through, and then you will have this tipping point early on reached. Choose easy targets to show off at the beginning that this is really working and let others shine and win. It's not about you or your role. If you wanna make it big, you need to find four or five people in each and every department that are also able to drive robots on their own so that the bigger topic together really gains momentum. And be restless because it always tries to push it. It always requires to push more and more and again and again. Um, outlook, what we're doing is we're gonna optimize our optimization uh, operating model more because once you read a search and scale, need to be professionalized. There need to be a certain process in driving it, certain um, requirements so that you are compliant with all those relevant items and you're also having an impact on the overall operations. Um, there's a great chance to combine it with big data and AI. I will speak a bit later about it. And to increase the development velocity, I'm also saying to democratize um, the potential to create a robot, right? Give everybody the ingredients and the tools to do it in a simple way, then you can drive it even more. Big data, second topic. Here, I think the biggest challenge that I've seen the two times where I've implemented in operations is to get the data, to clean it and understand it. And actually people are always standing around complaining we should do it and how do we do it and stuff like this. Again, I think there is no white knight on a white horse coming across and helping you. It's going to be you, you have to do it. There's nobody who's going to send all the data. So somebody needs to make the first step and try and push it. And data is great to have and then great to analyze and great to have an insight, right? So insight is nice, right? So for example, in soccer, if you know from where Messi will score most typically, that's great to know it, but actually more relevant is to have impact, right? Because when he's trying to score, that you actually save the ball and you prevent uh, him to score. And one example on this one is that when we were finding out um, that people were um, using certain combinations to cheat on us, to have fraud with us so that they can get on our phones, okay, it's good to know the typical um, characteristics of those customers, but in the end, you need to know which combination of names addresses or CMPs they're using, and you need to update this, you need to bring this in, you need to have a clear um, recommendation what to do. So it's not only about you know, the abstract information, it's about the concrete information and to bring this back into the organization to transform the business. That's the bigger part of that. Just knowing about it doesn't help. Really having impact is what you need to do. And our learnings from big data are, it's very hard to first step to gather the data and put them into one place to create this data lake. And also having support from among all, because everybody will say, well, that's like cleaning up uh, the closet, right? It's too time consuming, it's not paying off. If somebody is visiting my home, nobody's looking at the closet, but there's a great potential in the closet if you combine them. 
Um, bridging data analytics and understanding the business, that's one of the hardest part. You need to keep, have people that understand what is in the data and how it can impact the business and the insights to, into impact, as I said. And let's not get lost at the beginning building fancy data extraction and big analytics engines. You can do it very pragmatically, just throwing into one place pragmatic analytics to show again and to showcase it and then to justify further investments and question everything and go where no one went before. There's the real data mine. I will show you in a second what we have there. For us, if you combine stuff where never, nobody looked at before, there's a great potential if you find new insights. And for this, take the shortcut. So prove it first and then rapidly scale. Um, as you see here, you don't go, to go a roundabout, but you use the way above the roundabout. And you see that here, that's a, car, a, a map of Bucharest where we have combined the external data of uh, two, three of our couriers working for us and our internal data of customers trying um, not to pay. And you see that there are certain combinations of non-delivery and non-payment where you know um, that this is uh, really happening. So what we did is, okay, we did this one-time analysis and then we said, okay, for these, there's only pickup, right? There are certain addresses um, where they can do it and certain combinations and they are only allowed to go to the store. Others, uh, they're still getting it. So um, this is a, a practical example how we've done it very quick and dirty from getting data together, anal analyzing it in an area where we never analyzed it before and then directly do an impact so that we can showcase it and not just do fancy statistics and run around with the inside without having impact. Artificial intelligence, the next one behind big data. We know that 95% of data in Turquoise is unused and uh, we want to use them and to unlock it for our biggest potential. And here's how we look at this data. We need to find all the sources, assure that everybody has access and we understand the shortfalls of it and create this lake, but also it's fine to create it step by step. You know, not spend you know, one year to create one big lake without any analysis. Then the feeding and the storage, how often do you, you know, update it and um, how, how automate this and what is the power and robustness of storage and the ease of access. Here again, I think I'm very pragmatic. You know, let's take it you know, once a quarter or once a month to start from. So it's not too big of a hassle for the IT colleagues for gathering the data. Have an easy access for a couple of people and let them analyze it. There are a lot of analytic engines, and you will see it in seconds. So many opportunities to choose from. Let's start small and pragmatic. Train the people, that's key. Train more than you would like to train because this will pay off. And democratize again in organization in each and every department, allow them one person or two persons to be part of this analytic crew. People, it's really relevant here to find them and to encourage them and train them and have them as well learn as you go. And there needs to be a knowledge about market, business, statistics, software, and IT combined in this group that's working together so that you can really work like a little squad on this. And we see it's not only about the data analytics and the AI. 10% is only algorithm, 20% is technology and IT. The rest, 70% is business transformation for us. So it's cap building capabilities and also change management to transform them the business and to reach then a stage where we have automated feeding, constant repetitive feedback loops, and then this is always fueling in to a normal change optimization. But the first step is the you know, bigger change, bigger transformation, where you need to really push it into the organization and overcome also obstacles and resistance. And But who is actually the intelligent part of it, right? We have the established players that are offering this. It's IBM, Watson, it's Spark Beyond, it's Palantir, worked with all of them, also Capgemini. This is the one, but we also in DT now working or building up our group internal platform for AI. The benefit of this one is that with the established players, you're losing the algorithms, you're losing the insight when you're departing from them, right? It's not so easy to switch, it's very expensive. If you do it then combined across the group in an internal platform, that's perfect. And then also all the different countries are sharing their insights, their algorithms on this platform and you can, with little adaptions apply to your market and then benefit from this one as well. And in parallel, we are also trying out new challenges. They're various smaller startups. It's so dynamic that it's really, really uh, going ahead and fast pay, uh, pace the, the innovation. And um, we also have an ecosystem of venture firms around us. 
uh, small, um, smaller ones. And those we are trying out from time to time. And they're good ones, especially in the Berlin area where we are also actually experimenting with them. And there are four main areas where we're using AI to optimize our business. First one is network and the investment side, the CapEx side. How do I roll out? So the experience and usage is best for the most valuable customers. How to use cross-functional and cross-channel data to change you know, churn um, and also increase lifetime value and reduce fraud and bad debt. And then on the normal running business side, how can I react better on the service volume, improve and automate operations, customer service, predicting when to call, what to call for, what to react and all those things. And on you know, customer satisfaction side, which is the biggest thing I think which we need to drive. And I'm saying this not now as a CFO role, more or less, you know, as an overarching perspective, you need to use AI to create a great customer experience because then people keep on coming back. The other things are for optimizing your investments so that you can, you know, be smarter and a bit longer. But this one is the biggest thing you need to drive so that you really have a cool impact and you are really benefiting from this. And here you see what we've done in the past 12 months. We have you know, built a new churn prediction model, which is really cool and helping us, especially in the B2B area. And we've also built a very fancy and cool um, um, never payer prediction and credit assessment um, tool, which is helping us to reduce the chances to you know, uh, get stuck with that debt, but also be able to make more attractive offers to good customers that are really worthy uh, to have those. And we're really grateful for those insights because they've been helping us a lot to optimize our business. So we think there's even more to that, especially the network rollout side and the user experience and the NPS, so that we're going to be even better going forward. And I can just tell you that the great combination in the future will be to combine RPA, AI, big data, um, and with this then to serve by the digital user interface, web, chatbot, app, and whatever, our customers and also you know, bridge uh, the gap to the production layer in the company. One example from Germany, which I had where we're combining this, in the past, we had persons going to customers trying to you know, repair their line and their uh, fiber line and their routers. And then they were calling back to another person um, that was doing some measurements on that line because the system is so old. And they were waiting together for five minutes until the old system was telling the one guy on the phone but he has to tell the other one. We build an app on the phone of the technician that is automatically logging into the router when he's entering into the room. It's automatically doing the measurement. It's automatically sending this back to the backbone where an RPA is picking it up, making the measurement, sending the measurement back to the app, and the app is giving a recommendation to the technician. So this is a combination of multiple things, not only RPA, but also big data, but also in the future than AI and the, uh, the digital interface, where you see that if you combine it, there's an entire new frontier that you can also tap, which is making great user experiences for great experiences for technicians at that moment in time. And I think that's the future. And to capture this future, I think having no money, no resources or no support and no excuses, because you can always go there with a good story, sell the good story, push for it, get the tipping point, get the momentum, and then you will also have it implemented in big organizations that are sometimes a bit reluctant to big change. And I think I can only encourage you to drive this forward. I'm not saying we're doing everything perfect, just sharing what we've done in the past. And I have, I hope it has helped you a bit. And I'm happy to take as well your questions. Thank you. Well, uh, Nicholas, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, with all respect, I, I cannot recall to have a discussion with the CFO uh, that has a so accurate control of the terms RPA, artificial intelligence, or big data. Thank and you. Thank you. with all respect, <laughs> I was not sure if I'm this, if you're actually the CFO of the company or the CIO. But I can <laughs> bet if I, we, have, we have we have a great CIO. He's called Jovan, and I'm happy that he's the CIO because he. He really understands IT. I'm just understanding a little bit. So, you know, he should do the job, not me. <laughs> You're very modest. But yeah, I, 
it's very impressive, honestly. So I can, uh, you know, one of the first questions that comes up in my mind was, you know, who's driving actually the, the digital transformation in your company? Uh, but it looks to me that is clear the business and uh, uh, most likely comes from the CFO, CEO area. Oh, well, actually, actually, we have a, we have, it's a team approach. We have actually a persons just, you know, doing 100% of the time digital transformation there's the it colleagues there's the consumer guys and then there's sometimes uh, a steel ball with some kind of nerdy interest so uh it's more a team approach right okay i got some interesting questions here so because you spoke about the robots and you got uh, three thousand or something how did you make the team embrace the robots did you incentivize team promote early adopters assign more important projects well, um, the, the the very first team that I had actually, I um, I was running operations. There was a small IT team that I was supposed to lay off, and I looked at the team and I thought, okay, look, there are some people in there that have great skills. They're just in the wrong place, and others we didn't need, and we we laid them off. But with those, I sat down and I had it brainstorming what to do. We were you know traveling different companies and different countries. And we saw that we tried out some things and this RPA then worked out. So it was about this finding people with a background and giving them um, giving them a new chance, right? Because some people, they, they like to explore new fields and they were there. And then um, once it's um, gaining momentum, if you allow them to step in front, if you allow them to shine, if you allow them to be the person to be applauded, right? to stand up there, then that's that's what often pe drives people. So it was not, not not at all the money thing. It was more about driving something new, driving innovation, getting the reward. Look, when we built it, once what was big, we had all our group uh, executives coming, right? We had Tim Hutkes uh, visiting it. We had uh, Christian Lille coming. People are just happy when they get this recognition. And then you just step back and say, look, you run the show with Tim, you do it. And it, it's just amazing how it then picks up. Huh? Yeah, I think very good answer. Listen, uh, there is another one which in, it's pre, it's uh, almost in the same area. So a person checks the correctness of drawing up invoices in an Excel. How to convince him that an RPA will not take his place? Yeah, very difficult. And that was also a difficult dis discussion with the unions. I mean, the line that we always said was, look, um, uh, we take away the repetitive, uh, not so much value adding tasks. They are also boring for the person that is doing this. I cannot imagine that there's a person or there are very few persons out there that like to check invoices each and every day from eight to five yeah, and, and do that. They really would like to do something else. Um, and what we're saying is, look, then they can focus on more value adding tasks on different tasks and we will help them. We will train them into this one. And we will also, um, um, with this, allow them to further, you know, grow. And with this growing, they, sometimes there's also promotion, there's also money, there's also, you know, new experience. The real saving then when the end was really coming from, um, you know, reducing um, uh, spend for um, call center or other external partners. So we were trying to reduce it on the external side and we kept it on the internal side and then you need to shift a bit the work volume um, and you need to convince the people that there's a next step. But there will always be one third of the persons that you have that they will say, look, I'm not convinced. I don't want to do it. And with those, you need to then find a different solution now. There are some more in this direction, but I will jump to, to maybe the last one. Um, not the last one, but in the private sector, most decision makers consider data before making decision. But how can we persuade government decision makers to create data-driven, empirically validated results-based public policies? Wow, that's a very good question. It's very difficult. Huh? It's very, very difficult because what is the incentive of the colleagues in the government to do it this way? I mean, currently their incentive is to make decisions that most of the time are not, you know, it's not about getting the best breakthrough, it's more about having the least damage. And um, so per definition, they are not so much risk-taking. So you would need to find um, a platform or a, a secure area where uh, governmental colleagues 
would have a different incentive uh, on, on this one. It's very hard to imagine from you. I'm having the same question and something so obvious. Or the different thing is the government gives up certain or delegates certain areas to a more, let's say, privately driven environment or company where they then can act in that regard. Um, I think the government per definition will always be a bit behind in the laggard. I see it in Germany, I see it in Romania. It's very hard. I don't, I don't think I have a good answer to this one. Okay, there is another one from, uh, <laughs> from a CIO council member. Um, they are challenging with the following, how the blockchain technology will change the way you manage the privacy and personal data of all your customers? I mean, it, it's a great question. We, I mean, I'm not speaking for me personally, not for telecom. I think that blockchain is great because it will help you to, uh, I mean, it's, 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 you can with, with one you know, tip, you can always say, that's me, right? So I'm, you know, I'm signing each and every day so many documents and I'm signing with an electronic uh, signature and still takes me, you know, I don't know, a couple of seconds or minutes for certain documents. And here, I think if you just said, okay, it's me and it's gone, it's fine, right? So I think um, this is the same thing for our customers when they call into the call center. Okay, voice recognized, blockchain ID against it. Uh, now he can do everything that he wants. Same thing on the website. So I would think as long as we have a secure infrastructure where we can protect this data uh, from anything, uh, then blockchain is just wonderful because we'll you know, easen up our life in each and every dimension and we should just fully embrace it and try it out. Yeah, there are some more questions, but just the personal one. So listen, if, uh, for instance, we know where Messi is scoring more goals. So if I am a coach for Real Madrid, should I instruct you know, the defenders to stay more in that area? Well, I, I, would, I would think so. I mean, I was kind of you know, using it exactly for that purpose that you know, kind of catching the, uh, the attention. I think that big data analytics, analytics or this statistics in, in soccer or any kind of sports is, is great and you have to have it and you have to use it. Uh, but in the end, it's, it's also about when I'm a defender playing against Messi, whoever, look at him, how, how he's looking at you, how is he behaving, what's his, what's his body language, right? And then the body language of the day, the performance of the day is also a great thing. And there's intuition, which is in sports and human interaction still there. And this piece you cannot take away. You can predict some intents, but the intuition in the end is still there. So yes, I would tell them do this, but also you know, follow your stomach. Yeah? Nicholas, thank you very much. I will invite, I launch you an invitation for our annual event that will be probably in September uh, because it was a very, very interesting conversation. And I, I, I know that uh, I, there, there were too many questions for you. So uh, we have to reserve a special session. Nicholas Marl, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the time. Thank you.